Okay. All right. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for all my brothers and sisters who are here with me. I thank you for all the kids out in the hallway who are packing those Thanksgiving boxes and for all of the uh, activity going on around here in service to others. Father, I'm so very grateful. So, Lord, just be with us and bless us. Continue just to pour out your spirit, um, a spirit of service, a spirit of giving, a spirit of ministry. It's just a marvelous thing to behold. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, Bobby, would you be so good as to, to close the, the door there? Uh, I love the kids, but um, they, they've never been accused of being quiet. So, all right. Uh, yes, it's the quiet ones you got to watch. That's right. All right, so tonight uh, we're looking at uh, the first four verses of James chapter 2. And I think I want to... Yeah, let's 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 start by reading these first four verses, and and then I'll uh, I'll share a, a little a little story to kind of set it up a little bit. James chapter two, verses one through four. The sin of partiality, my brethren, do not hold your faith in our Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothes, and you say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there, sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Mm. Let's pray. And so, Father, 2,000 years later, we still struggle with that. And so, Lord, let your word convict us and cause us to repent of any such sin of partiality. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Thank you for the spirit that you've given us. Pour out your spirit on us tonight, Father, as we study your word that he would teach us. Open up our hearts and minds, our eyes and our ears and our spirits to you. And be with us as we pray, Lord. And again, Father, thank you for all that you're doing around us, with us and through us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So once upon a time, I met a man named Harvey Thomas. Harvey's an Englishman. Big, big guy. Um, there are a lot of Harvey stories I could tell. Uh, but tonight, I want to share one little piece of Harvey with you. Um, Harvey has had probably the most remarkable resume of anybody I've ever met, of anybody I've ever heard of. Um, for 12 years, Harvey worked for Billy Graham, mostly as Billy Graham's executive producer. So anywhere in the world that Billy went to do a crusade, Harry, Harvey had been there six months before, lining up the hotels, the venues, the security, the speakers, the music, and everything else, and then off he went. Well, as most of you know, Billy Graham, uh, throughout his career, was very uh, close to every president, uh, regardless of uh, political affiliation. And curiously enough, Billy Graham probably was closest to Richard Nixon than he was anyone else. Um, and so one day, um, Harvey is with Billy, and Billy gets a phone call. Uh, they are somewhere within about an hour's drive of Washington, and um, the president would like to see Billy at the White House. And so Billy hangs up and says, come on, we're going to, going to the White House. So they drive up to the White House, and Harvey's thinking, gee, the last time an Englishman was here, we burned the place. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he goes in, and he said, you know, I, I just was kind of overwhelmed by the whole thing. And he said, I'm sitting in the Oval Office, and there's the President of the United States, and... Uh, there's Billy and there's two or three other people and me and he said I'm just sitting there trying not to say anything because if I and I said he said I know as soon as I do I'm gonna sound stupid so just keep my mouth shut and he said I was amazed watching Billy and just how totally relaxed he was the entire time 
And so as we were leaving the White House and walking back out to our car, I said, how do you do it? And Billy looked at me and says, how do I do what? And he said, how do you do it? How do you sit down with the most powerful man in the world as if you're just talking to a friend having coffee? I mean, and you do this with heads of states all the time. I mean, how, how do you do it? And he said, Billy looked at me oddly and said, well, Harvey, they're just people. <laughs> wow, they're just people. And Harvey said it changed my life right then. Um, the next real job Harvey had was press secretary and campaign manager for Margaret Thatcher. Oh, wow. okay. But they're just people. <laughs> um, like I said, he has the most amazing resume of anybody I've ever heard of. What was his name? Harvey Thomas. Harvey Thomas. Is he still with us? He is still with us. Um, I, I, I've had him preach at Grayson and at, and at Green Acres in Athens, and I had hoped against hope to get him here to Orlando. I don't know, but, you know, I mean, we all get older. He's not traveling as much. Uh, uh, but um, if, if he were to, it would be just wonderful. Um, any time we can get him. Because um, he, he's lived an amazing, amazing life. Um, so more about Harvey later, remind me. But, you know, Billy's point that they're all just people is exactly what James is saying here. You know, if, if a celebrity walks into church, typically what, what does the preacher in church do? Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like for you to meet Brother Billy Bob here. He's got the new hit record we've been listening to on the radio, and we're just so glad he's here today. Thank you. Be sure to tithe. Um, you know, and that's what we do. I mean, anytime somebody, particularly when it's uh, election time, you know, that's, that's when all of the politicians make uh, their rounds to the church. You know, they're... they're uh, um, Baptists at the 9 o'clock service and they're Methodists at the 11 o'clock service, but it, whatever it takes. And, and we do the same thing. doesn't matter over and over again. You know, well, Senator uh, Bumpus is here and we're just so proud of him and just so glad. And, you know, isn't his wife pretty? I'm sorry. Oh, I mean his associate. Yeah. Um, you know, and we just kind of, we just kind of do that. We, you know, um, but remember what, what Billy said to Harvey. They're, they're, they're all just, people. Um, and and that's, that's the thing we should always remember. Um, you know, they're, they're all just people. Um, there's a, a very, very, very bright young girl uh, who uh, grew up with my kids. Um, uh, sometime I would like to get her, if I could twist her arm, I would put her up on the platform to give her testimony in a minute. Um, uh, and she would play well here because uh, uh, Alessandro Quinones, um, her parents are from Puerto Rico, um, a beautiful name, beautiful girl, beautiful spirit, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Christian girl. Other than my daughter, she puts some of the best, the best Christian material up on her Facebook and Instagram pages I've, I've, I've seen. She has made her entire career since she was 18 in Hollywood. Uh, working in the entertainment industry, um, um, and there's there's not a big name music person you could throw out there that she hasn't worked with, um, and yet, <laughs> you know, Alessandra Quinones, Ellie Quinones, uh, she's got a few things on YouTube. She's a dancer. That's what she does. She was Justin Bieber's dancer for a long, long time. And these days, if you, you know, look at anything that floats across your screen about uh, him, um, most of it has to do with his faith these days. Um, supposedly, he got saved at Hillsong, New York, a few years ago. And, um, uh, and I just got to believe, on some level, she had something to do with that. I asked her one time, I said, so how does that work? You know, when you're on a world tour, 64 shows on a world tour with him in a year. Um, and she said, uh, I don't know how it works with him. We never see him. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean you never see him? She goes, well, he flies. We take the bus. Um, and he said, but I'm in charge of all the girls. And so before we go out, 
Uh, we have Bible study on the bus. We pray before we go out, and I make sure that they're in when they're supposed to be in. Um, her dad has been a prison guard for a long, long time, so she knows how that works. And um, uh, just, uh, uh, just an amazing, amazing young lady. Um, so how do you do it? How do you, how do you not get lost in all of that? Well, intuitively, and through scripture, I'm sure, she came to the same realization that Billy Graham did. They're all just people. They're all just people. Um, not going to get knocked over by the star power. Not going to get knocked over by the glitter. Not going to get knocked over by the money. They're all just people. Um, so with that in mind, let's, let's, have, a, let's have a little look at, at what uh, Brother James has to say. Let's look at just verse 1 for the moment. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism, an attitude of favoritism, or a respect to persons, that, that practice of undue partiality. Now, it's amazing in a time before anything electronic or anything, 60 AD, I mean, how primitive is the world in 60 AD? But by that time, just 30 years after the death of Christ, the church had become remarkably diverse. The church included not only people from all across the Roman Empire, and if you think about from Turkey to England, uh, North Africa to almost to Poland, uh, yeah, that's that's pretty diverse population. Um, but also from every social strata as well. And Roman society and just ancient society was very, very, very socially structured. Um, if you were born a noble, you will die a noble. If you were born a slave, you will die a slave. Except for rare opportunities where you might be able to buy your freedom. So in the church, you had the very wealthy uh, who often opened their homes to be worship centers. Uh, you think of Lydia in the book of Philippians, the first convert in Europe, a very wealthy woman, a merchant, and she opened her home, and that was the, uh, that was the center of the church in Philippi. Uh, you have civic office holders who often protected the church from her enemies, and you think about uh, Paul's adventures in Corinth and how the Jews tried to kill him, but he's staying with one of the civic office holders, and no, 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 you can't, can't hurt him. Um, there were middle class working people. You know, Paul was a tent maker. Um, so were others. You know, they were, you know, silversmiths or cobblers. Um, middle class working people. Then there were just people who were just poor. And then even below the poor were the slaves. Now slaves in that culture are different than typically how we think of slaves in American culture. Um, uh, a slave could be seen freely going about life in the streets. Um, they're on an errand for their master or mistress. Uh, so they leave the house, they go to point A, they do whatever it is the master or mistress requires, and then they come back. They don't have any supervision, they don't have chains, uh, and there's no question, for the most part, that they're going to leave the house, go, and come back. Um, where are they going to go? There's no place in the world that they're going to go that they're not going to be a slave. Um, just part of, part of life. Uh, and as such, they were not uh, people in the Roman world. They were really just tools. Uh, they had no will of their own. They had no rights whatsoever. Um, um, if, uh, if the master wanted to uh, punish them, the master could punish them as much as they wanted. If the master wanted to reward them, they could reward them as much as they wanted. Uh, if the master wanted to kill them, they could kill them. There's no punishment because that's not a person. Even in America, you remember part of the compromise in the Constitution is how do you count slaves? Are they full people or not people? So they were one-third people. Um, 
Uh, oddly enough, it was the Southern representatives who were arguing for their personhood because they, then would, they would get counted towards the House of Representatives. Uh, it was the Northern people who were saying, no, no, they're not real people. The world's po politics is a crazy place. Um, and so in the church, as they gather together, let's say at Lydia's house in Philippi, she's a very wealthy woman. She may be sitting next to a middle-class working laundry woman on her left, and she may be sitting next to a slave on her right. And there is no place, no place anywhere in the world where that's going to happen anywhere else. No place. Uh, there is no place that a slave would be sitting next to anyone because slaves were not allowed to sit where regular people were. Jill? What made them slaves? Was it a nationality? No. No. It had nothing to do with race. It had nothing to do with, with ethnicity or anything of the kind. Um, most slaves were either born into slavery. If, you were, if your parents were slaves, you were slaves. Or they were captives. So as the Romans, say, moved into northern Europe, and as Julius Caesar took over Gaul, and they would bring back whole villages of, of defeated Gaulians, Gauls, uh, all of them became slaves. Um, and the Roman general could decide how they were parsed out. Maybe he wants some. Maybe his generals want some. All the rest could then be put up on market, um, and the sale then go to offset the cost of the campaign. Um, uh, sometimes they were just bought in markets. Slavery had been around for a long time. So as they go to Turkey, uh, as they go to Egypt, and the Egyptians have slave markets there because the Egyptians, just ask Moses, had been in the slave business for a very, very long time. And so they could buy you know, all the slaves. Well, so slavery then became a growth industry. Um, the number of slaves in Rome, let me, let me check, but I, would, I, would, I think at one point the majority of people who lived within the city of Rome were slaves. Um, uh, for a time being, the majority of people living inside the city walls of Rome were slaves. Uh, because you think about it, in a given household, You've got a husband, a wife, maybe three or four kids, and 20 slaves. Uh, you know, doing everything. You know, doing all the housework, the cooking, working in the barns, working in the, you know. So you have a, you, you have a, a minimum number of people, uh, you know, who are family, but you have a lot of slaves. The teachers, the tutors for the children were slaves. Uh, the accountant who ran the house and kept all the money was a slave. Um, and, you know, and these were not dumb people. Some of the most intelligent people in the city were slaves um, and were, were respected relatively as such. Um, uh, there were slaves who spoke on the floor of the Roman Senate on behalf of their master. The master couldn't make it, the master wants to make a point, so he sends the slave with a speech and the slave gets up and gives the master's speech. Um, and so it, uh, it, was a, it was an interesting culture uh, and the question of you know, was slavery bad? No one even asked the question. I mean, that's, that was part of the dilemma prior to the American Civil War that you had because yeah, morally people felt, particularly in the North, that this is wrong. Biblically, gosh, there's a weak argument against it. You know, every now and then you could find a verse here and there where slavery, eh, not so good. Um, but, you know, Paul says, look, if you're a slave, be good to your master. Masters, be good to your slaves. Uh, doesn't say anything about a moral question or anything of the kind. And again, he's writing to the church, right, in his letters. He's not writing to the Romans, you know, pagans. He's writing to the church. There were masters and slaves within the church. And so uh, the best book in the Bible is uh, Philemon on the subject because it's all about returning a runaway slave who Paul had met in Rome back to his master. And what does Paul say? I need you to receive him, I need you to receive him as a Christian brother. Uh, do not punish him, uh, do not harm him. Uh, he is your Christian brother in Christ. I need you to, what's that Christian word? Forgive him 
And he will come back and he will serve you as he should. Um, well, again, even at that, even though Paul's not saying, look, you're a wicked slave owner. You just need to repent and free all your slaves. Paul doesn't say that. But what he does say is, is you should forgive him. You should treat him as a brother. That is a radical concept. And even after the Civil War, when the slaves in America were free, there wasn't a whole lot of brotherhood going on there. You know, but that's what Paul was advocating, that it doesn't matter what your social position is in the world. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ and that person next to you is, that person is your sister, that person is your brother, regardless of where we are. So, all right, so you've got... You've got that kind of structure, and it's unlike any place in the whole world. And that kind of social favoritism that James is speaking against here was condemned throughout the New Testament. Um, you remember in, uh, in Luke 21 and Matthew 26, the Pharisees come to Jesus, and, and they're trying to set him up for a trap, and they, they start off by flattering him. Well, teacher, we know that you are no respecter of persons. But, well, even they had to admit that. You know, he didn't play favorites. Um, after Peter's vision in Acts chapter 6, where the uh, picnic blanket is brought down from heaven three times, and every kind of unclean animal is, is on it, this voice from heaven says, uh, take and eat, you know, and Peter's like, no, I can't. Oh, it's awful. They're so wiggly and everything. No, I can't. And, and, you know, God says, look, what I've made clean, you cannot dispute. And then the next thing Peter hears is a bunch of Romans downstairs knocking on the door asking for him. Um, then, you know, Paul, in Romans 2.11 and Ephesians 6.9, Colossians 3.25, and just throughout his, his letters again and again and again and again, drives home the point, there is no partiality in God. What does he say in Romans? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Um, they're all just people. They're all just sinners in need of of redemption. Remember when Paul was on trial towards the end of the book of Acts and uh, King Agrippa says, Paul, stop. Sooner or later you're going to make me a Christian. And Paul says, oh, if only. <laughs> you know, if only. You remember when we were looking at Amos? The uh, ten years we spent going through Amos? Such a long book. <laughs> Every single sermon, it seemed like, Amos was banging on Israel for the way that they showed partiality. You cheated the poor. You put your own people into slavery. You know, but those of you who are wealthy, oh, well, you know, there's, there's a whole different set of rules for them. Um, and so you see this in all the prophets. You see it in Malachi 2.9. Uh, you see it in the Law of Moses. You see it in the Psalms. You see it in the Proverbs. Proverbs 22 two says, The rich and poor have a common bond. The Lord is maker of them all. Um, you know? Uh, birth and death, uh, they, they, they're, they, they, they don't care about uh, you know, what your name is or uh, uh, you know, how much money your daddy has and, and so forth. Um, you know, when, when a baby's born to a poor woman or a baby's born to a rich woman, it's going to hurt just as much. Uh, if, if a rich man's dying or a poor man's dying, you know, it's, it's, it's dying. It's, it's just all the same um, because they're all just people. So James, uh, James relates the story then in verses 2, 3, and 4. He says, for if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothes, and you say, sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or just sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? 
Now, as you know, James has been at this pastor thing as head of the church in Jerusalem for a long time. How many times do you think he's seen that very scene played out over and over again? Um, the ancients loved their rings. Uh, uh, one, one Roman writer said that uh, uh, he had at least one ring on every finger. Uh, ten, ten rings. Um, just loved, loved his rings. And I'm ignoring him. And because I love that lady. Uh, and so the early church fathers worked to get the wealthier Christians to tone down their bling. And the, the dare I say, the rule of thumb was one ring instead of ten. So in his example, a man with a singular a gold ring comes in. But bearing in mind that even that one ring, if it's a solid gold ring, pure gold ring, it, it would likely cost more than the poor man would earn in a year or more. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the discrepancy um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the income and in the, in the wealth. So similar stories then are found and instructions similarly are found in other ancient books of order that were circulated around the churches. The one that is preserved the best is called the Ethiopia Statutes of the Apostles. It's quite a name. It goes back to roughly the uh, 300s, 400s, and it states in uh, wonderful King James English, if any other man or woman enters in fine clothes, either a man of the district or from other districts, being brethren, thou presbyter, speaking to the preacher, the pastor, while thou speakest the word which is concerning God, or while thou hearest or readest, thou shalt not respect persons, nor leave thy ministering to go and command places for them, but remain quiet, for the brethren shall receive them. And if they have no place for them, the lover of the brothers and sisters will rise and leave a place for them. And if a poor man or woman of the district or of other districts should come in and there is no place for them, Thou, Presbyter, Pastor, go make such a place with all thy heart, even if thou will sit on the floor, that there should not be any respecting of person, of man, but of God. Um, so I think that's interesting where he's telling the pastor, look, if a rich guy comes in and you're crowded, you just keep preaching. You just keep reading. You don't, you don't stop. And let the brethren take care of them, and the brethren will take care of them. But if a poor man comes in and there's no place, you do stop. You do stop. And you go and you make a place for them, even if it's your place, and let them sit down. Um, and you see why that would be important, right? Because what's it doing if the pastor stops and says, whoa, 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 you, you come and sit, sit here. What's it doing when he does that? Sure, what else? You're serving. You're serving, yeah. And it's sending a message, isn't it? Sending a message, sending a message. It's not what we say, it's what we do. And, and so the message is that this person is every bit as important than anybody else. Notice that it also said, even if they're from this district or from other districts, here's a stranger who's poor. We don't know them at all, but we are going to give them the seat of honor. We're going to let them know that they are welcome. We are grateful. We're going to give them the best seat in the house, even if it's my seat. And, and you know, that's the message that we're going to send. If a wealthy person comes in, they've got a pretty good seat at home anyway. You know, and you, you don't need to make a fuss over them because even... What, what, why didn't they, why didn't, why wasn't it equitable? Why not say let the, let the pastor stop when the rich person comes in and lets them sit there? What message does that send? That this person is important, not because they're a brother or sister in Christ, but because of their wealth. Even if that's not the pastor's intention, that's the message that's going to be sent. 
you know, it's, it's, it's all about what you do and, and the perception that's out there. And, and so these kinds of little books of order and, and rules of how church works circulated all around for hundreds of years. <clears throat> but it's interesting that they would also basically sound exactly like what James is saying. So 300, 400 years later after James is writing, they're still dealing with the same issue. And so are we. So what's the deal? Well, the deal is that this is basically the process that we call sanctification. Normally we think about that just as an individual Christian. But it's also true of a whole collection of Christians called a church, whereby the ways of the world are squeezed out, wrung out, like you wring out a, a sponge or a towel. Uh, you, you wash the ways of the world from us, where in the end, we look no more like the world than Jesus did. And I played with that sentence for a few minutes before I wrote it. All right. What did Jesus look like in general? Where is he from? Common. Sorry? Common man. Common man. Yeah. Daddy was a carpenter. Mama stayed home and kept kids. So he dressed like that. Um, common man. Um, in a sense, outwardly, he didn't look any different than anybody else. It's the inside that, that mattered. And at that point, he looked very different than anybody else. Um, the church was literally the only place in the world inside the empire, or even beyond it, where those social class distinctions didn't matter. And that was very, very different. Let's say you're a banker. You're a wealthy man. You're one of the two or three wealthiest men in town. And you get saved. And you come to church for the first time. Now, you've never been to church before. You're not real sure what to expect. But they bring you in and they sit you down next to a slave and a carpenter. How many times has that happened to you in your life? Never. <laughs> that has never happened to you before. How does it feel initially? This is a little weird. Yeah, it's, it does. It feels, it's different. It was a new way of thinking. It was a new way of living. It was a new way of relating to others. It was the way. It was the way. And, and folks... Even a cursory look at the Gospels finds Jesus eating and drinking with sinners. There he goes again, hanging out with those tax collectors and those people. Yeah. Walking through Jericho, there's the mayor, there's the pastor of First Baptist. And he looks at the tax collector, the little guy up in the tree. Come on down. I'm going to your house for dinner. It's a good move. He was going to offer the best meal in town. And who in the world is going to be at the house of Zacchaeus? None of, none of the good people. No, no, no. And then Jesus leaves town and he, the first thing he does is he leaves Jericho is he touches uh, a blind man. Ugh. And there he goes touching lepers. Ugh. And now he's talking, actually having a conversation with a Roman centurion. And he's willing to go to the house of a, <laughs> a Roman to heal his servant. Who is this Jesus? And now, Jesus, where are we going? Samaria? Lord, if you looked at a map, we don't, we don't go to Samaria. If you saw... Uh, season two, the last episode of uh, The Chosen, you have this wonderful moment where Jesus and the Twelve come to the fork in the road. And you remember what Yogi Berra said, when you come to the fork in the road, take it. That's right. And so Jesus takes one step, and instantly the Twelve are going, whoa, 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 no, that way. And Jesus said, well, that way would take six days to get to Jerusalem. This way it takes only three days. Yes, but Lord, that, that way goes through Samaria. And Jesus said, 
Really? Samaria? Wow. Right, so let's go. Lord, don't you know what they have in Samaria? Samaritans. Samaritans. That's right. And at that point, at that point, Jesus gives him an eye roll. And he says, look, I just ask you to follow me. And if you're going to question me every single step of the way, this isn't going to be much fun for anybody. So follow me. And off to Samaria they went. Taking retreats into Lebanon, where they've got Lebanese. You know, they're, they're there talking. Remember, the Syrophoenician, the Lebanese woman, comes up to him. Please heal my daughter. You know, and they're like, go away. None of these social taboos mattered to Jesus in the least. None of them. None of them. Nor did he have patience, particularly for the twelve, when they objected. You see, for God so loved the whole world, not just the nice parts, not just the parts that we like. Um, have you seen, by the way, that they're doing a, um, a spinoff of The Chosen, The Jesus Revolution? Um, all right, go on YouTube, just type in Jesus Revolution trailer. Um, it's set in 1969 America. Some of you remember 1969? Well, parts of it. Parts of it, yeah. If you, if you can remember it, you really weren't there, right, Jerry? Uh, and you know, you know, you know what they had in 1969 in America. Hippies. Mm-hmm. And how did the church respond to the hippies? Back. Back. And oddly enough, and I need to dig into him a little bit, because boy, I was sure surprised when I saw who it was. So it's a story about a preacher in a church. And Kelsey Grammer is the preacher. And that's what I said. Hmm. So I need to dig into him a little bit, where he's the pastor of this small church and he's got teenage kids and and they're looking towards the hippies and not looking back at what dad's got and the guy that plays Jesus and the chosen meets him and he looks just the same because you don't have to go far to go from Jesus in the first century to a 1969 hippie and um, and he kind of helps him to understand what it means to be able to, to reach this generation that you're not reaching. Uh, it's, it's, it looks really, really good. So I'm, I'm anxious to, to have a look at it. And as I'm watching it, it reminded me of a story. I shared about a year ago that there's a couple of really, 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 really good books on evangelism that were in print when I was in seminary and were required reading for my evangelism classes, and they're still in print. And one of them is entitled Out of the Salt Shaker and Into the World. Out of the Salt Shaker and Into the World. Sue's nodding her head. Uh, by a lady named Rebecca Pippert. Pippert, P-I-P-P-E-R-T, Becky Pippert. And in it, she tells the story, because it's, I mean, she wrote it a long time ago. And so she's, she's, it hadn't been that long since 1969 when she wrote it. And she said, she was sitting in church and a uh, hippie came into church and he's got all kinds of hair he's got on his peasant shirt and his blue jeans and his bare feet and he walks straight down the center aisle and sits down there right in front far out and she said everybody waited to see what was going to happen and it interrupted the sermon and everything else. And this old gentleman gets up, and everybody's like, oh, good. This ought to be good. This ought to be good. Go get him, Ed. You know. And Ed slowly walks down the aisle and um, sits down with him. In another book, she said it took Ed a little longer to get up than he did. But it changed. That moment changed that church and how they looked 
at this new culture of young adults that were surrounding them. Um, because they're all just people. Terry? What's interesting is that shortly after the hippie revolution came, got going, the Jesus festivals came. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's the Jesus Revolution. That's the name of the movie. Yeah. yeah, 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 that's right. And they were awesome. And they were awesome, yeah. Somewhere I've still got a decoupage Jesus thing I made back in about that same time. Nobody under... Careful. <laughs> under 60 hardly remembers what decoupage is. Look at verse 4 a little bit. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? This is, this is, by asking the question, the rhetorical question, this is James' basic unspoken call to repentance. He doesn't say the word, but that's what he's doing. He's calling them to repentance at that point. Because when you make those worldly class distinctions, I like the rich guy, just tolerate the poor guy. James is saying that we are committing a sin and making ourselves out to be judges. Jesus said we are not to judge lest we be judged, Matthew 7, 1. And so when we make those distinctions, we are guilty of judging a person by their outside appearance, by their clothes, by their jewelry, by their shoes, by their wallet size. None of which means anything in the kingdom of God. None of it means anything in the kingdom of God. Everybody's seen It's a Wonderful Life, right? Mm -hmm. Who would you want in your church? George or Mr. Potter? George. I'll take George. Yeah. But Mr. Potter needs to get saved. <laughs> right? Mr. Potter needs to get saved. God told Samuel, when Samuel was there looking for God's anointed, it's a great story. Samuel comes to Jesse and says, the Lord has sent me to your house to find the next king of Israel. Show me your sons. And he brings in the first one. He could play Superman. <laughs> Tall, square jaw, good looking, muscular, Surely, Samuel says, I'm looking at God's anointed. And God said, nope. And one after another, tall, strong, handsome, bright young men, nope. And so when Samuel finally says to Jesse, do you have any other kids? Well, I do have my youngest son. He's out with the sheep, but you don't want to bring him in. I mean, he's a scrawny little rotten kid and he smells like sheep. Bring him in. And as soon as David walks in, God says to Samuel, that's the boy. And then God pulls Samuel aside and takes him out to the woodshed. Have you ever been taken to the woodshed by God? Oh, I have. And God tells him that he failed, that the prophet failed, because you're only looking at the outside, and I only look at the heart. I only look at the heart. Um, so as we're greeting visitors, keep those things in mind. As new people show up for the walkthrough live nativity, keep those things in mind. I'll share one little surprise I got this week. Those of you who've been here a couple of years, think back. Do you remember an interesting looking fellow who showed up one day? Named Anthony. Tall, athletic looking, not quite Baptist looking, carrying a backpack. And everybody got very anxious about that backpack because that was about the time of the big church shooting in Texas. Anthony had left New York City. His doctors told him he needed to get out of the city, he needs to go to some warmer climate, Arizona or Florida, made the right choice. 
And he, uh, he didn't have a lot of extra money. He had fit, spent all of his money fighting a legal battle in New York and lost. And so he loaded up all of his worldly possessions in his Jeep and started camping his way down south. And he was camping out at the state park. And he was with us for a while. And we went on an interesting adventure with Anthony. I got an email from Anthony this week. He wanted me to know that he's doing just fine. He's had an apartment, actually with a regular roof over his head, for the last two years. And that he is hoping to buy a house. And that he still has his old Jeep, and he has worn it just about slap out. He needs new brakes. And if anybody knows of a brake mechanic in Miami, he would be glad to meet him. And he wore out the Jeep by picking up and delivering Operation Christmas Child boxes. Um, who do you want, George or Mr. Potter? I'll, I'll take George. I'll take Anthony. A little off kilter, interesting guy. But for God so loved the world, he sent his only son to Anthony. And Anthony's serving the Lord any way he can, even to the point that he's worn out his Jeep delivering Operation Christmas Child Boxes. They're all just people who need Christ. That's right. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for, for being with us. Um, I guess, Father, for us... I pray that you would give us the eyes of Christ to see as he sees. So when we see that leper, when we see that tax collector, when we see that, that place that society says is taboo, our Samaria's, that we will see it the same way Jesus does. That they're all just people for whom he died. And so, Father, help us to be able never to judge by the world's standards and only to see by Christ's standards. For all the stuff on the outside doesn't mean a thing. It's all about the heart and who rules that heart. Thank you, Lord, for being with us tonight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.